Holy Spirit in the church, and uh, uh, it's interesting. I've got a special lesson on lesson on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit later on, so we're just touching on the on the outer uh, uh, edges of this. Um, some people find it difficult to understand. In fact, I had a conversation in Bible study the other night. Um, uh, somebody said, "Well, how do I know I've got the Holy Spirit?" Uh, and uh, well, how do you know you've got forgiveness of sins uh, when you're buried in the waters of baptism? Uh, you're buried in the waters of baptism because God has asked you to do that. But He says, if you do that with the right attitude and, the, and, and for the right reason, He says, "This is my promise: you will receive the forgiveness of your sins and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit." So. Um, it's based upon the promises of God. It's not based upon uh, anything uh, that I need to feel or, or think about or feel uh, something going up my back or whatever. Uh, if we can guarantee that God is faithful and he has promised us when we're buried in Christ in baptism that we have forgiveness of sins, we have the same confidence that it's the same faithful God who also promises that the Holy Spirit indwells us. And so it's based not upon what we understand, but what God has promised. And that's the, that's the powerful thing about that. So it should be no trouble, after all, we should surely believe there is a spirit, a human spirit, that inhabits a physical body. Uh, Paul describes our physical body as the tabernacle, our tent, our dwelling place. Uh, and uh, we're made up of uh, so many chemicals. Uh, and yet these chemicals that you can put in, uh, as if something like uh, 36, 36 jars on a shelf, uh, these chemicals are walking around in the thinking, and they're empowered. So you could take all the chemicals in the human body and you could stack them all up on a shelf, but which chemical, which jar would life come out of? And the, um, uh, Paul writing in Thessalonians says, we are body, soul, and spirit. So here's the body, the physical body, getting better looking day by day, more rounded. Uh, then there's the real me, who indwells this physical body. And there's a spirit that God has given us, the human spirit that God has given us to recognize spiritual things. And then when we become Christians, if you can explain to somebody where your spirit dwells in your body, a human spirit dwells, then you can go on to explain them where the Holy Spirit uh, dwells in your body. Because, you know, uh, all we see is the tabernacle. We don't see the real me. We don't see the, the spirit, uh, the, the human spirit. And we don't see the Holy Spirit. But now we're technically... Uh, not just a tripart being, a three-part being, but a four-part being. Uh, the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in us. And, and so it's uh, based upon the promises of God. So if we can explain how our own human spirit inhabits our body, then perhaps that will help us to explain how the Holy Spirit is able to live in us. Yeah. Can yeah. we go back to that a minute? Yeah. Uh, I think you, you need an S on the hour, this physical body of ours. Hello, sir, man. Um, because otherwise it, it's, a bit, about, uh, it's a bit confusing. This is true. Put down there an okay. S. Can you go in there? I don't I'll, know. I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to the are 16 different chemicals, and that's another thing. Uh, how many? 16. I, I thought it was a lot more. Chemicals, 16 chemicals. 16 chemicals. I thought it was a bit touching, <laughs> but that's okay. Well, I would have looked at yeah. that. It's been yeah. a while since I looked at those chemicals. Uh, so, I think, yes, all right. So, we need that S on okay. that. That's how but here's something to consider. Look at John 14, 23. Jesus said, All those who love me and will do what I say, my Father will love them, and we will come to them and live or abide with them in them. Okay? So there's a promise that the, uh, when we are Christians, uh, that God, the Godhood dwells in us, and obviously in the form of the Spirit. So first we find the Father and the Son in dwell, live, abide in the Christian who keeps uh, the word of the Saviour. And then uh, 1 uh, Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? And you are not your own, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay? So there's a, quite a strong passage that implies or even stronger than implies, it actually states that when you became a Christian, uh, the Holy Spirit came to dwell within you. Uh, and therefore, he said, he challenges us, what kind of life are we going to live? How are we going to use this whole body? Because it's not just us now, wherever we go, God goes with us. Uh, and that can be good news, it can be bad news. Uh, Romans 5, 45 says, 
Endurance produces character and character produces hope. Hope doesn't disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Okay? So the Holy Spirit has been given to us. Now, there are people in the world who, as an overreaction to the charismatic, the Pentecostal uh, movement, uh, where they are enamored with the Holy Spirit to uh, the nth degree, um, because when you think about what Jesus said, uh, and Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come. And part of the Holy Spirit's job was to remind us of our Savior and our Redeemer in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit's job isn't to, to say, look at me, I'm the Holy Spirit, see what I can do. The Holy Spirit's job was, uh, part of the Holy Spirit's job is to say, remember who died for you. Who remember what the person who uh, has been raised from the dead, and because he's been raised from the dead, you also will be. So his job is to focus on Jesus, focus us on Jesus. It was never the Holy Spirit's intention to focus on himself and say, look at me, I'm the Holy Spirit. It's me you should be interested in. It's me you should be worried about. Uh, his job is to focus us on Jesus. And, and uh, uh, as a result, sometimes we in the church, in the wider body of the church, we've been frightened of the Holy Spirit uh, because the Pentecostals run and I'm up with him. So we've been saying, well, we don't want to go down that route. And so we try to water down the Holy Spirit. And some would say, the Holy Spirit indwells us through the Word. Uh, the Bible, if you like, is the Holy Spirit. The more we read the Bible, the more we have of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what these text says. This is the Bible, the Word of God. It's telling us that the Holy Spirit Himself is indwelling us. Uh, however that is, and, and whatever we can think about that. Remember, we're not doing Jesus Himself, in, in essence, He said, I, I'm here talking to you 12 apostles uh, but I can't be with you everywhere always so I'm going to go I'm going to go back but I'm not leaving you alone the Holy Spirit, the Comforter will come and He will be with you and that means uh, in this room I can be with you tonight but I can't be with Johnny tonight because he's someone else I can't be with uh, the Christians of Peterhead tonight because they are someone else but because the Holy Spirit is Spirit, there is some way in which the Holy Spirit can be with us here. It can be with John A. Kettering, and it can be with Michael and Peter Head and the rest of the Christians and Peter Head. The Holy Spirit is Spirit. And He's not just to be poured into one little bottle, one little life. He, he can be in all of our lives at all the time. So where Jesus was bound by the flesh in one place at one time, he says the comforter won't have that limitation. So when Peter goes off to preach, and when John goes off to preach, and all the other apostles go off to preach, the Holy Spirit was with them in that preaching wherever they went. And the same with every Christian that they ever uh, came into contact with, whoever they ever brought to Christ, every pastor and brought to Christ, receives the indwelling. Of them. So the Holy Spirit isn't just confined to them, it's confined, it's not, con not confined to any of us. It is in all of us. And I know that's a bit difficult to understand, but there again, the air that we breathe isn't confined to the body. I'm breathing air as well. As a matter of fact, in certain instances, I may be breathing the air in just umbra. No, we don't want to. Anyway, the, uh, the, it's a fact, air is everywhere. And it can be in us as well as being everywhere. And that's not an excellent that illustration, but it's an illustration that the spirit isn't bound by physical time. So the physical, the, the spirit can be like air in that sense, that it can be with each one of us, wherever we find ourselves. So do not realize these verses mean the Father, the Son, and the Spirit inhabit the obedient child of God. The Godhood, the Godhead, lives in each of us. So let's look at some passages briefly which tell us precisely what the Holy Spirit is capable of doing for us. Romans 8, verse 1, 14 to 18 says, He says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So we should not be like cowering, fearful slaves. You should behave instead like God's very own children, adopted into His family. Father, dear Father. They offer our friends as Abba. We cry, Abba, Father. But His Holy Spirit speaks to us deep in our hearts and tells us that we are God's children through the Word. 
John later on, first John chapter 3 says, you are children of God because of our relationship with God. It goes on and says, since we are children, we share his treasures. For everything that God gives his son Christ is ours too. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Yet what we suffer now, he says, is nothing compared to the glory that we will give us later. Okay? So there's a, an element where uh, Christ is with us in every experience, the Holy, through the Holy Spirit with us in every experience. We share in glory and we share in suffering. And then Paul later on will go on to say, what is the suffering of this world compared to the glory that we are about, we're going to have in the future? And that's what keeps us going. He bears witness that we are children of God because he, the Spirit, is the Spirit who adopts us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 22, he says, He identifies us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment of everything he will give us. So he's the, he is the uh, Aragon, the, the seal. He confirms our sonship as a seal of our salvation. A seal to certain, several important things. It marks as genuine. Romans 8 verse 9 says, You are not to be controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. You have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them are not Christians at all. He says, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, then you can't claim to be Christians. You've got to have the Spirit of Christ, because that comes automatically when we become Christians. Uh, and uh, it, as our argument continues. So a seal of the Holy Spirit, which God has given us, indicates ownership. We belong to God. It guarantees security. God says, Jesus is coming back to take us home. It's a pledge of intention and earnest and arbon, the guarantee that God is not only with us now, but he will be with us for all eternity. So the Spirit guarantees all that. And, and if it, we trust in him and continue in him, we have that guarantee that we are in a right relationship with God and he will come back for us. He is the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 1, 13, 14 says. And now have we also heard the good news that God saved you, and when you, when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. So it's something that God intended us to have, this Holy Spirit, uh, as part of our lives. The Spirit is God's guarantee that will give us everything he promised, and he has purchased us to be his own people. And this is just one more reason for us to praise our glorious God. Uh, that's a beautiful passage, the whole passage in, first, in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, in Christ, in Him, through Him. He is the Spirit who sanctifies, helps to make us holy. As for us, the Thessalonians, uh, writes Paul, to write the Thessalonians says, We always thank God for you, dear brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. We are thankful that God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation. A salvation that came through the Spirit. Who makes you holy by your belief in the truth. Okay? The Holy Spirit's job was to convince the world of sin. Convince the world of righteousness. Convince that one day God's going to come back in judgment. And because we understand that, and that Jesus has died for us, we accept Jesus on the basis of those things, that, and through his life we have life. And so he, he says, if that's true, if God has saved you, if God has redeemed you, if God has forgiven you, if God has taken away your guilt, what kind of people ought you to be? How ought we to live our lives? To his praise and to his glory. Sanctification, 2 Peter 1 verse 2, 3 says, Chosen, destined by God the Father, sanctified by the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling of his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So sanctified by the Spirit, in the Old Testament, there was lots of things that were sanctified in the temple and in the tabernacle. And that means, if, if a carpenter making a chair, and he was making a chair for a household, and he was making a chair to go into the tabernacle, then the chair that was going into the tabernacle, that was dedicated, that was sanctified, that was set apart for God and God's purposes. It wasn't like that. It was like that, but it wasn't like that. Same chair, or different chair, he made, looks similar, to the one he gave to the family, who anybody could sit on. And anybody could do anything with it. You could even stand in your wallpaper. Don't need to do that. If you had sanctified the chair to God in his service, it could only be used in that service. And God says, we have been sanctified. The Holy Spirit has sanctified us 
to make us special unto God, to serve God in a special way, to be the best that we can be in order to reflect who God is to a, a world that so badly needs it. So we're set apart for service. It's interesting that every time uh, some people talk about being set apart, they think that means that God has said, hey you, I'm going to take you and I'm going to give you heaven. Set apart for salvation. It doesn't do that. Every time it's used, it's used for set apart for service. Set apart to be useful. <clears throat> he says another part, we are God's workmanship. God's working on us to make us the best that we can be. God is working on us to be the light of the world. God is working on us to be the flavor, the salt, the savior, the savor, the savor, that will touch people's lives and draw people to God in Christ through Jesus Christ. And, and so it's sanctified, made holy, set apart for service unto God. Blessed is the God of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, by his great mercy, we've been born anew to a living hope through the resur resurrection of Christ from the dead. There's our relationship to God. It cost the life of Christ for God to set you in a part, you, you and me in a part for service. And again, it comes back to cry, what kind of people are we going to be? Are we going to be uh, allowed to God to set us apart for his service? Uh, 4 verse 22 to 5 says, For you remember what we taught you in the name of the Lord Jesus. God wants you to be holy so that you should keep clear of all sexual sin and keep you, and each of you will control your body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passions as the pagans do, in the ignorance of God and his ways. The word sanctification, hagiasmos, it's related to holiness because the word hagios is the word for holy, hagiasmos is the word for holiness. Mm -hmm. Sanctification, separation, anything, anyone described in the scriptures, sanctified or made holy, separated for God's services. And the challenge for us is to live up to what God already sees us. This being the case, the first case in sanctification is cleansing. And so the Spirit helps us to cleanse ourselves from the sins of our lives that we may be effective in serving God. Listen to Paul to Timothy. Uh, Timothy is going to be a preacher, a teacher, going out, touching people's lives. And he says, if you keep yourself pure, you will be a utensil God can use for his purpose. Your life will be clean and you'll be ready for the master's use for every good work. Uh, how many politicians in this last few months have you heard of uh, when they were wanting to, to rise further up the tree? Somebody says, you can't rise further up the tree because you've been doing this. You've been doing that. You've been doing something else. And suddenly this person who seemed in the world's eyes to have a, a, a great future ahead of them has suddenly broken down because people couldn't have found a handle that they could pull. And that's our relationship with God. Something we, we say to God, we say to people, I, I believe in God. I, I believe in Jesus. I, I'm, I'm a servant of Jesus. And they poke a finger right in their lives and say, is that right? Well, what about this? And what about that? And what about the next thing we go... I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I, I, look at Jesus. Don't look at me. But sadly, who are they looking at? They're looking at me. And that's the part of the problem. Uh, God wants us, if we want to be effective, he says we need to try and, and, and strip off the bad stuff and help them to see the good stuff. Um, run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Follow anything you, that makes you want to do right. Pursue faith and love and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord from pure heart. He says, we need to be together. We need to uh, encourage each other. We need to lift each other up and, and help each other to be the best that we can be. In the addiction uh, field and in the, in the, in all sorts of stuff, well, why, why do you go to NA and why do you go to AA? Because you recognize you've got a problem. You recognize you need help and deal with that problem. Uh, once we're in Christ and the family of God, why, do you, why should you spend time with fellow Christians? Because you need help, you need encouragement to keep on the straight and narrow. And so uh, the, the, it's, a, it's a, a mutual encouragement to be the best that we can be, despite all our sin, despite, despite all our failures. If a man cleanses himself from these, he shall be a utensil, a vessel of honour, sanctified for the master's use. And there's our challenge. If we want God to use us, we need to prepare ourselves to be used. 
If we want God to use us, we need to open ourselves for the opportunities that God can use us in, in different ways. And, and, and it's a reality that you know we struggle with day by day because we all fall short of what we ought to be. And the fruit of the Spirit describes lots of good stuff. <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit controls our life, He will produce this kind of fruit in us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. There's no conflict with what law. If we can be this, then we don't need to worry about sin because we won't have time for sin. We don't need to worry about saying those nasty things because we're too good, too, too uh, busy saying good stuff. And we'll be encouraging each other instead of pulling each other down. And, and that's the hard struggle. This is, this is a, it comes from the within, it grows out of us. Uh, but it doesn't grow by itself. We need to, to help it, we need to put it in the right ground. We need to put it in the right fertilizer. We need to put it in the right support network uh, to enable us to become the people that God wants us to be. And it's, not, it's a lifetime commitment to be able to do that. Those who belong to Jesus Christ are nailed, he says, the passions and desires of sinful nature to his cross, crucified him there. If we're living now by the Holy Spirit, we need to follow the Holy Spirit leading in every aspect of our lives, not to be conceited or irritated with one another or be jealous of one another. Tough stuff. It's a challenge. How easy is it to be bad? Dead easy. How difficult is it to be good? Tough. How easy is it, is it, how easy is it to say the wrong thing? Dead easy. How is it to say, how difficult is it to say the right thing, to think about what you said and, and how to say it? That's tough. Uh, it's easy to destroy, it's easy to break down, it's easy to fall down. It's harder to pick ourselves up and keep going. It's harder to go the right way and do the right thing. So it takes work. It takes uh, a, 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 a struggle day by day. Every new morning we wake up and say, this is the day, I'm not going to do anything wrong today. I'm not going to say anything wrong today. I I'm not going to be negative in any sort of way. And if you manage past 10 o'clock, you do really well, okay? We, we, don't, we, we don't read the fruits of the Spirit, but the fruit. Different fruit comes from different trees. Every verse, the name of these verses is produced by the one action, by the true Holy Spirit being allowed to live in our lives and work through our lives. The Holy Spirit warns against false teachers in First Timothy 4. One, he says, the Holy Spirit tells us clearly, in the last time, some will turn away from what we believe. They will follow lying spirits and teachings that come from even demons. What the apostles wrote for the commands of God, 1 Corinthians 14 says. What? Did the word of God originate with you? Are you the only one that has reached? If anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge it. What I'm writing, Paul says, is to you as a command of God, of the Lord. If anyone doesn't recognize this, he is not recognized. In the religious world today, in the religious world today, not just the not the anti-God world, not the atheist world, not the agnostic world. In the religious world today, there are people out there who claim to be religious who says, you don't listen to the Apostle Paul. Yeah, you don't want to listen to what he says. You don't want to follow that bit of the Bible. It's, all, it's not even the Word of God. Uh, uh, Karl Barth, I think it was, uh, he, he believed that um, <clears throat> the, the Bible contains some truth isn't the truth in a sense of it isn't inspired by God but it contains some good bits or inspired bits that are helpful. That means you can pick and mix. Remember the old woolly store when you went in to buy some sweets a big old rack? Pick and mix. That's what people do with the Bible. They go in and pick and mix their own. I don't like that bit. Ooh, I don't like that. I believe that bit. And that's what they do. And Paul here in St. Corinthians says he says you're arguing about uh, being the best for God, you're arguing that your gift is better than his gift and, and this is better than that. And he says, listen to me. I, what I'm telling you is from God. It's a command of God. It is, it's the word of God. And if you don't recognize it, he says, he is not recognized. He won't recognize God. You need to listen to what we have said. Thessalonians 4 says, finally, we beseech you. That's strong language. We beseech you, we exhort you, we encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have learned from us how you ought to live and to please God, just as you are doing, you do so more and more. For you know 
what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So basically, they, all the apostles were saying, what we are saying is not what we are saying, what we are saying is what God has told us to say. And so therefore, if you deny what we are saying, if you ignore what we are saying, you're not ignoring the apostles, you're ignoring God, because it's Him speaking through us. And so there's the foundation of what we need to believe, the truth that has been revealed. So we need to listen to the Holy Spirit teaching through the apostles' writing. Little children, we are, you are of God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, what they say is of the world. The world listens to them. We are of God. Whoever knows God listens to us. And he who is not of God does not listen to us. And by this you know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So anybody comes along and says to you, Paul didn't know what he was saying. Paul was a woman hater. Paul was this. Paul was that. He says, they are not of God. They're ignoring what God has done to us. Matter of fact, I quoted this passage to somebody recently. And, and they, their argument was, ah, well, we don't really know who wrote first God. What? Anyway, let's try to, that was a religious study. A very religious study. Mm -hmm. But a tragedy. The passage is saying, if you don't accept what I'm saying, the Apostle John says, uh, they're not of God. And the pastor said, well, we don't really know whether John is sort that or not. Okay. The New Testament, the New Covenant, is the inspired word of God given to man by Jesus Christ through the agency of the Holy Spirit and through the Apostles' writings. The Old Testament was concealed, in the New Testament it's revealed. How, <coughs> Revelation 3, 3, 5, how that by revelation he has made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery, which in other ages has not been made known to the sons of men, as has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. The mystery of the Old Testament revealed in the New Testament. We ought to allow the Bible to interpret itself. We simply need to believe it. Revelation means to make known that which was hidden. The mystery which was previously hidden was made known to Paul. And he was made known to Paul. He wrote it down. <clears throat> Simple as that. That which Paul wrote down. The Ephesians could understand when they read it. And these things did not be previously revealed. But now it is revealed by his Holy Spirit and the Apostles. The New Testament, therefore, is the inspired word of God given to man by Jesus Christ through the age of the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle's writing. Now we'll repeat that again. The promise of the supernatural aid, the Apostles, had not reference merely to their verbal instructions and their ability to preach, but also to all the writings as the appointed legislators, and it's a good word, to plenipotentiaries of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven. Say that again, man. Yes, plenty, plenty potentiaries, potentiaries, that's a good word, isn't it, Frank? Frank will let you know what it means later. Uh, it really means speaking on the authority or by the authority uh, of, with a message that's been given. Uh, it's used uh, in, in political terms. A plenty potentiary was a, a, a representative. Representative. So whatever he's, we use, we use the term in um, um, uh, First Corinthians, Maybe, uh, when Paul says we are ambassadors of Christ. Okay? The ambassador goes to a different country and says, I'm here on behalf of the king, <clears throat> and this is what the king wants me to pass on to you. So he doesn't stand up there and then say, But I think this might be a good idea, and this might be a good idea. He's, the king didn't say that. He then takes every scroll or whatever and he says, blah 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 blah, and this is what the king wants me to let you know. Uh, and that's what they're doing. They're letting us know what the king wants us to know. Because they don't have the right or the authority to speak on their own behalf and like that. So, an ambassador, representative, and messenger. Uh, strong, stronger than a messenger. Uh, an ambassador is really a higher up person than a messenger. Anyway, at the postman could be the messenger. 
Okay. Uh, but a, a, a messenger can be a, a, a delegated individual with no power and authority of his own. But a ambassador is usually a very articulate, very uh, well spoken, knowledgeable person. A messenger had no authority. Yes. All he had to do was to deliver to a message. message. A, a plenipotentiary or an ambassador has the authority to speak on behalf well, of the person who sent him. Okay. But it's, it's, it's interesting stuff. It's good, good stuff, really. Let Latin be even more important than the former. The effect of their address was temporary, but the influence of writing will endure forever. Okay, so um, the apostles spoke, they spoke the word of God, and when they died, the message didn't die with them because it was written down for us. And here we are 2,000 years later saying, Paul said, because the Holy Spirit said through Paul, because the Holy Spirit passed on the message that Jesus got from the Father to pass on that we need to know. Basically. <laughs> it's a bit like that. So the Holy Spirit continues his work through the revealed word. He confirmed the word. He convinced men through the gospel. And he converted men through the gospel. And he sanctified, he made men holy through the gospel. The gospel has been revealed. The new covenant relationship is to be found in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And there's where, where we reside. Uh, for many people, religion is a maze. Uh, you know, where do you begin, where do you go, and where do you go to Christ? And I don't know if you ever had a go to maze. Some of them are, some of them are pretty tricky. You get in there and think, oh, get me out of here. <coughs> now the work of the Holy Spirit is to help us guide us through the maze. And so the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us into all, guide the apostles into all truth. The apostles wrote that truth down. Now we have access to it. So we can, we can see the maze, but we can also see the way out of the maze. Or way, way, should say, way through the maze. Uh, so the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us through the Word of God to help us to get back to, the, to God or to, to the, out, out the back out of the maze we find ourselves in. Now, this is interesting and helpful, important, okay? The Word of God is a seed, or well, the seed is the Word of God, Luke, Luke 8, 12, 11, 7, all right? If we have the Bible alone, that's God's revealed Word alone, and if we do what it says, how it says, then the end product will be then we will come into our relationship with God and we will become just a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing added, nothing taken away. But, if we add, for example, the Methodist discipline to the Bible, then we end up being a Methodist, becoming a Methodist. Oh, I meant to do that. I forgot to put that on automatic. Uh, <coughs> So, the end of a Methodist. If you are, the certain any articles to the Bible, they end up becoming a member of the Church of England. If you are the Catechism to the Bible, you end up becoming part of the Catholic Church. If you are the Bible's Baptist manual to the, to the Bible, you end up becoming a Baptist, because these are the rules. If you are the Book of Mormon to the Bible, you end up becoming a Mormon. If you had any other book of rules, to the Bible, you end up with a different gospel and a different religion. Now, there are loads more you can put in there. If you add the watchtower and the awake, you'll end up in a Jehovah's Witness. Okay? So, so, you all add, so what, we, what do we need to strive to do? What has God said? Who has Christ died for? What's the ultimate reason Jesus gave his life? It was to help us give back to God, be redeemed, become Christians, and uh, have the eternal destiny that he promised to own to his Christians, to his, to his followers. Uh, therefore, we, we ought not to follow any of these other things. We need to kick them into touch and get back to what the Bible says. And that's really the plea of, of the church, or should be the plea of the church. Um, There's, there's something, uh, this is something uh, I'm going to throw in, 
Okay. The Bible by itself will make a Christian by their understanding of it and the reading of it. But we are complex people. And before we listen to what the Bible has to say, sometimes people have got to learn to trust us. So sometimes when we talk to people about God, we just tell them, here's this fact, this fact, this fact, what are you going to do about it? People's makeup are more complex than that. They may listen to the facts, but they may look at our life. They may listen to the facts, they may look at the way we state the facts. Uh, there's lots of people in time past who have been beaten over the head with the Bible, and all they've ended up with is a headache. They never, never come to Christ. And so Jesus said, you need to speak the truth in love. And that aspect of love means, means that sometimes for us to help people to understand what the Bible says, we've got to spend time with people. We've got to share our lives with people. Bernard, when he was in the, is a chippy back, back in, the, in the days when he was helping people with the council, and he was busy knocking out their old windows and putting in the new windows and, and, and drinking as much tea as he could get his hands on. <laughs> of course. Um, in that short period where he was taking out the windows and putting in new ones, they came to know Bernard. And so when he started to talk about Jesus, they were <clears throat> prepared to listen to Bernard. Because they didn't, he didn't come up to the door and say, Yeah, Jesus died for you, uh, you need to, you're a sinner, you need to be born again. But he didn't do that. They saw his life, they saw his love, and then they listened to what he had to say. Uh, you with, with uh, Edith Stewart, you worked with a person, you spent time with the individual. You may not like him every day of the week, because that, that's the way people are. But if we invest time in people, then they're more likely to listen to the truth of what we have to say. So it's not just a question of taking the facts of the Bible and putting them out on display. Uh, we sometimes are going to invest our life in people that they may get to know us. They get to know the Jesus that we know. And through that Jesus, they will then listen to what that Jesus has to say. That's the hard part. That's the way it should go. Okay? So, the conclusion. Inspired revelation of the Holy Spirit was supernatural, verbal, and final. Where is the room for, and some people say, we're waiting for new information. We're waiting for a new revelation. The Jehovah's Witnesses say, <clears throat> when, when, I, when I talk to them about the, the amount of times they got it wrong, they say, ah, new light has been revealed. And I said, but one of your watchtowers says, New light will never contradict the old light. Okay? So even the new light, that didn't help that much because what they were saying was a contradiction. And, and even the old scriptures, even the old bunch there said, new light will never end at all. Uh, there's no room for new light. The light has been revealed. Jesus has died once for all. And therefore, he shouldn't need to be crucified again. And the revelation is there once for all. It shouldn't be done again. Jude says that we have the faith once for all the living saints. So are we satisfied with what the Spirit has said about himself and other things? Have we obeyed the Holy Spirit? Uh, we ought not to reject what the Holy Spirit has revealed. So when you talk to people and they say the Bible, we don't need the Bible today. They're not denying you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Holy Spirit. They're not even rejecting the Holy Spirit. They're rejecting Jesus. They're not even rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting God. Because this is the Word of God that's been revealed once for all that we might have the opportunity of salvation and come to the knowledge of salvation. <coughs> dun, 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 dun. Okay, that's it. So I was going to do that. I'm within time, so that's a, that's a bonus. Any questions what you saw? Helpful? Yeah. Helpful. The illustration that you used about the cherry, very good one. You know, yeah. the cherry in one place being uh, secular and the other being sacred. Sacred, yeah. 
the only, the only way, place where he falls stone with, there would be no chair in the sanctuary. Well, the priest was never allowed to sit yeah, at all. Yeah. Right, I didn't think about that. Only stand, the priest <laughs> would only stand in the sanctuary. And that's the significance of what it says that Jesus is sat yeah. down in right. the right. island. Yeah. That's the, that's the one. I, even, with, even when I was doing the illustration, but it, the, but it, it, it falls, falls down in my face. I thought about it as soon as I said it. I was thinking, as I was saying it, I thought to myself, there's no chair in the tabernacle. But anyway, uh, but it's, it's a good yeah. illustration. Carl, by the way, way, Karl Barg, yeah. uh, Karl Barg's idea was that uh, <clears throat> the Bible spoke to you and you interpreted it yourself. But the best thing that he said, that I believe anyway, at a convention in Germany, he was asked, what is the greatest thought that has ever occurred to you? And this man stood up with all the theologians and he said, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yeah. And sat down. Yeah, that's right. <coughs> and and then witness. It, it's unfortunate that Karl Barth's um, legacy. No, his German, it, it German mind works in a way yes. different from other people's. Uh, he, he left a legacy that, that actually people uh, use against the Bible more than actually draw people to the Bible. Uh, I've heard them used often yeah. uh, as an excuse for, well, you can just take this bit and, and you can forget about that. The strange thing is, though, he's still very highly respected. Oh, yes. In spite of that. <coughs> many, many of them are. Many of them are. But it's, yeah. it's, it's sad. <coughs> I mean, I'm getting older, okay? The more, more I read, the more I appreciate um, that everybody, every one of these great theologians, even though they said some really <coughs> rubbish stuff, some stupid stuff, <laughs> often said some good stuff as well. Mm. They're never all bad. No. I, think, uh, I used to use a, a what was that, that guy's name? Uh, Deisman. Deisman was another German theologian. And, and he basically tore the Bible apart. But actually when you read some of his stuff, if he, can, if he can get through the morass of the stuff he got wrong, he's got some beautiful stuff It's right, you know. Uh, it's crazy, but uh, we're complex people. Yeah. And we need to get back to the book. But a lot of these people detract from the book uh, instead of pointing us back to the book. And they're used and abused uh, as they do that. But it's sad, really. Uh, stop. But Frank, we just want to pray. Oh, who's who's that, Chelsea, there? Which one? That one there. That's a, that's, that's, <laughs> I hope you take a note of that. That's, that's his new email address <coughs> for his new <coughs> website. Um, I've got my first, my first PowerPoint ready to go up. Uh, Terry's checking through for spelling mistakes uh, 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 today, and it hopefully will go up uh, in this next week. Uh, and the rest of the website that matches it, hopefully, will be available maybe in two weeks' time. So the link, you'll go to the website, get the link, and you'll be able to go off and look at the PowerPoint. And, and later on, you'll be able to look at the video. Uh, these two that classes for Adam Frank. Okay, which may be a good thing, maybe a bad thing, you never know. Yeah. At uh, least one prayer, Frank.